Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to the best thriller writers in the world. Now, while I don't put myself in that category of the best, I've certainly got my hat now in the ring. And after nearly three years of hosting this podcast, I think it's time to toot my own horn, if you will. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale all this month. It stars Detective Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat in Hollywood when one of the town's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home only hours after winning an Oscar. Beloved by her fans, Pat thinks someone wants this star dead and sees this as a way to forge her own path and get the promotion she craves. I'm proud of the response I've gotten from fans and I'm confident you're going to like The Poser. So for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only five bucks or the paperback for 14. Since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this as a way to help out a fellow thriller writer. There are two ways to reach the link. First, you can go to davidtemplebooks.com Com, scroll down to see The Poser, click, and you're on your way. Or head over to Amazon. You can find it there. Again, davidtemplebooks.com or Amazon. Thanks in advance for your support. And now, on with the show. Hello and welcome to The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. On today's 168th episode, I am pleased to welcome renowned crime writer James Grady, the man behind the classic spy thriller, Six Days of the Condor. As you'll recall, that became the film Three Days of the Condor. Today, James and I will discuss his latest book, The Smoke in Our Eyes. Well, James Grady, welcome to The Thriller Zone, our big official start. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me and, and to your listeners and viewers also. I mean, this is this is an honor for, for me well, to be with you guys. It's our honor. And I'll tell you what, I don't remember when it was back in the fall, I think your folks at Pegasus and uh, surrounding groups, uh, publicists, etc., told me that I had a chance to talk to you. And I'm like, wait, James Grady, three days of the Condor. They said, yeah, I'm like, yes, please. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> so we're going to talk about the smoke in our eyes. My prop is not here, but it, we're going to talk about it, of course. But for those folks who don't know, you may go, oh, I mean, I personally, you're a household name to me, James. But some people go, well, I haven't, uh, I'm not in the know. I don't know who James is. Well, Six Days of the Condor, he wrote out of the gate. You were a kid. Oh. And uh, tell me about that. Let's just talk about that. Let's start there. I can, can you believe how lucky I was? I, I wrote it when I was 23. I wow. sold it when I was 24. It came out when I was 25, and the movie came out that year too. And I'm I'm just swirling in in this wonderful tornado of of great luck. I mean, I've wanted to be a writer since I was 10 years old, and suddenly I thought I'd be 60 before I, I got a chance, and then suddenly all my dreams are true. That was, it was an amazing time. It was an amazing time. And I, I think actually the fact that, that, that Condor was a character dealing with the paranoia and the unfolding scandals of that era. Um, I was, I was the guy at the right time with the right ideas uh, and the good luck to be able to find someone to listen to me. Well, let's just stop there a second and bask in that, because I think a lot of my listeners who are uh, aspiring writers think, oh, if I just get that one magical thing, my day's going to be made. It's easy street. They're going to be throwing cash at me. Woohoo. I can sit back and take a year or two to write my next one. You're an anomaly. It's also called lightning in a bottle. But I applaud you. And I'm like, man, what a lucky guy. And you just said at the right place at the right time with the right story in the right psyche of the day. I mean, a, a trifecta, quadrifecta, maybe. Yeah. And the but the other thing is that all all our aspiring, aspiring writers out there have to realize you have to keep going. Yeah. It's, it's it, it, it is not something that you can bask and they'll come. They'll come looking for you. I mean, there was, I confronted uh, a lot of, let's call it cynicism and fear that I would burn out, you know, the, the, the women, drugs, whatever, that this this 25-year-old kid from Montana was not going to be able to sustain 
more than a couple years. And so we, the publishers, better get everything from him. We can't. And I just, no, I, I, I'm here as long as I can. I'm, I'm looking at a long, long time. I love writing. I mean, I, yeah. who was, who was that author uh, who said, I hate writing, but I love having written. And I thought you're in the wrong profession because I actually love just that moment when you realize the right word. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. It's, it's, it's just a great moment. Well, <clears throat> James, yesterday I had to sit at the orthodontist and wait for them for about 45 minutes. So I was very lucky to have my smartphone nearby with some decent Wi-Fi. <clears throat> and I downloaded the script to Three Days of the Condor. Now, I didn't need it because I've got that movie memorized. I've seen it, my wife and I've seen it no less than, I promise you, 12 times. But here's the point. I started reading it. And I started hearing the voices. I could hear your writing. I hear their voices. And you're writing, of course, not the screenplay, but the book. But the point is, you know, all those characters came alive for me in an instant. And the minute Robert Redford's in the phone book uh, trying to be called in uh, and Higgins is on the other line, I can hear Higgins' voice. And I'm just like, the power of words and storytelling was rejuvenated. I think the first time I saw that movie was, help me out on this, l late seventies. Yeah, yeah, basically. Uh, okay, I think November seventy five was probably when you when you hit your screen. Okay, so I'm in, uh, yeah, I'm in high school. I'm a sophomore, and that movie comes on, and I'm like, whoa. And of course, who didn't love Robert Redford? All those cats that were really, you know, top of the uh, world in it. Yeah. It was, yeah. And, you know, it was what was interesting about the writing of the movie was they kept, they would wake up in the morning, Sidney Pollock and the, and the screenwriters in Redford, and the news of the day looked like a whole different world. They had to keep fine tuning their script so they wouldn't get overrun by events as they were shooting, which does not usually happen. And it was, it was, uh, wow. It, it, they, they did such a remarkable job and were, by the way, they were so kind to me. I can't even begin to tell you, um, just small niceties, uh, th that happened. It, it, which isn't still, something you hear today, is it? Oh, no. I've had other things filmed in which I've been banned from the set. And <laughs> this, uh, you know, this, <laughs> this, and, and, and I'm a guy who's not, you know, I don't run in and yell, no, stop or anything. I mean, I, right. it, it's just a different era. And I, I think it's partially we're, we're nicer with, there were nicer people back then. Yeah. I, well, a strange way to look at it, you know, the world was a nicer place back then. It's funny. I, I ran across something on Twitter this morning, which you, you shouldn't be surprised when you see uh, anxiety and or animosity in a thread on Twitter. But I was seeing some stuff spoken to a friend about a friend of mine. And I was like, see, this is the world that we're in now. And you can stir the, uh, the hornet's nest and, and ruin people's lives with a, with a tweet, which is a, an insane place to be. I don't want to digress on that, but um, my point being, it's a different world now. I've got something you have to tell me. I heard an inside scoop. I don't want to ruin it for my listeners because I love moments like this. Of course, the book that you made famous was Six Days of the Condor. The movie that I love is Three Days of the Condor. My biggest question, and I know you got the answer, how did it go from six to three? Sidney Pollock. The director, who was, who was 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 at the same time a modest and a very deep thinking man and a very savvy professional, took me aside and said, "Look, I realized I could not photograph Robert Redford on the run for six days because he'd look scruffy. He, he wouldn't be able to shave as enough." He would, yeah, it just, it wasn't going to happen. So I made the screenwriters compress everything as much as possible, 
when we got to the end of their polish draft, we counted the number of days and we had three. And that's why we changed the title. I mean, it's isn't that great? It's perfect. <laughs> it's absolutely perfect. It makes sense. Uh, you know, this is the kind of story that feels like it should be done in three days. It, it, it only ratchets up the attention and the tension and the uh, terror, all the tease. So thanks for sharing that. That's, that's, that's amazing. It was just an amazing configuration created by a, a band of artists working together. Yeah. No, there were no... There, there were no prima donnas on that set. And that's saying something given today's world. Yeah, I would call that a perfect storm. You were just, you know what this is? I, I don't want to say you were lucky because it makes you sound like you fell into something without any talent or having done the homework. But because I know you have the talent. I've, I've read your book since then. I know you've done the homework. But boy, there is a little bit of luck. Would you not agree that when you, you get that perfect storm that rolls in and the sun shines right on top of you uh, and you have this kind of a turn of events, it just... It is. And it, I, I keep telling people when I go out to give public speeches or, or interviews that I'm probably the luckiest author they're ever going to be in contact with because that sunshine came down on me at ex and brought with it the exact moment of, of, you know, configuration of events that, that I couldn't have made up. Yeah. You, know, you, you couldn't have made it up. I mean, it just, yeah. So not only did you get six turned into three and have that movie made, but then it spawned the current uh, Max Irons TV series, Condor. And right. Which, uh, that's, you know, let's, so we've got this, you came out of the gate with a book, but not only this, all these years later, you came out uh, with more Condor books, Condor.net, Last Days of the Condor, Shadow of the Condor, Condor Mysteries and Profiles. And then, of course, three dozen or a dozen novels, three times that many short stories. Do you think Condor has the ability to continue on ad infinitum because every once in a while you see this happen i mean i think of lee child and reacher i mean i think he does i think that the fact that we all have at some point in our lives been put in a moment of terror or or a moment of peril gives this character who unbeknownst to him is going to go, go to work that day and his whole world is going to explode into terror and peril. I think that's a story that's going to happen in 20, you know, 29, 29. Uh, yeah. we're, if we're all still here. We're all still going to be having those moments. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking back to when Robert Redford walks in. There's two things about Robert you got to love besides that handsome face is he is the master of the double take. He does that thing about, you know, he's walking along <laughs> and he does it. He, he does it completely naturally and yeah. completely when necessary. That's yeah. I mean, this is the man is only now getting uh, the recognition of being a great actor as well as being one of the most handsome men of the 20th century, you know, yeah. but his, all his other movies, uh, you just can't Butch Cassidy. I mean, you can't go beyond that. The sting, this guy, this guy. The wow. one movie, uh, I, I think it leads three days of the condor, but by only a couple of viewings, James, so don't feel poorly. But my favorite movie, and it's something my wife and I do on a day when we just, you know, we have 1,700 channels, 30 different services. Oh. And on those days, maybe it's cloudy, rarely here in San Diego when we go, we just want to like veg out, pull the curtains. Nine times out of 10, we're going to pull up all the president's men. Uh, and, you know, there's a really interesting linkage there because the novel Condor was set in Washington and they were, they were planning on filming it in Washington when Robert realized that if, if they did that, he lived in New York and he was going to have to move down to Washington DC 
for about 18 months and leave his family in New York City. And he said, look, there's one of these two novels that we have to change its location to New York. And we can't do that with all the president's men, but we might be able to do it with Condor. And they said, you know, let's do that. And in a way, moving Condor to New York made it almost more surreally scary. Yes. Because you expect that kind of thing in Washington, especially when with the Nixon era was going on. Yeah. But in New York, no. And so so Redford's decision to basically serve his family needs yeah. um, as well as, art, as his artistic integrity create, created uh, this great duo of, 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 of movies that he did. Yeah. And it just, you know, that's a story very few people really know. I see. <clears throat> James, this is one of my absolute favorite things about this show. And I said this to Terry Hayes recently, who's going to be uh, kicking off February. And he, uh, who has kicked off February, he has, he said to me, or I said to him rather, I said, you know, Terry, if it weren't for the fact of this podcast, chances are I'd probably never meet you. And I say the same to you, James, likely I would never meet you. And I likely I wouldn't get to hear these inside stories, which are some of my favorite little morsels of life. So thank you for that. Are you kidding? For me to be able to meet you and to tell this story to someone who appreciates it and gets it. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my treat. Yeah. You know, I was, I was finishing <clears throat> the smoke in our eyes which is what we're going to transition to now. And um, the, the style, albeit uh, completely different than Six Days of the Condor, it still had your voice in it because I, I, was, cause I, I went back to Six Days, started reading it, did not finish reading it, but I read uh, uh, several chapters and I really got a sense of time and place in the way you set up a story and uh, you took the languorous moments that were needed, which is one of the beautiful things about a book. And then I go to the screenplay and you still have that voice resonating in there. And I just loved it. Then I go to smoke in our, uh, the smoke in our eyes and I go, wow, you can still hear his voice, but it's an, it's, I don't want to say it's an entirely different style, but it is a, 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 a morphed style. It is slightly different. And I just want to say out of the gate, kudos to you, dude great book. Oh, thank you. I well, you know, what's interesting is while some people would not categorize the smoke in our eyes as a thriller, it's got I think it kind of is. I mean, it's basically it's 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 a story of of tragedy and vengeance, a story of law versus justice and it's all on a ticking clock. The thriller genre has always been kind of looked down upon by certain, you know, cultural critics. And I want to say, well, you know, there's this, there's this friend of David and I have this friend named um, Bill, and he's got this book about, you know, ghosts and spies and a castle and his father's legacy and, and, and a love affair. And he came to us and, and he said, you know, I'm not quite sure what to call it. And we both looked at him and said, why don't you just call it Hamlet? And when you look at when you when you look at much of what is classic literature, it all is driven by the same components that we thriller readers and lovers adore. You know, yeah. East of, East of Eden, a great. I, I I mean, it just goes on and on, and you can even and you can see this going out into other art forms too. You know, yeah. Picasso's Guarancana, for example, or Springsteen's uh, Born to Run. You know, it just uh, there, there, or or even better, Atlantic City. I mean, yeah. they, these are all examples of how we as consumers and cultural lovers like to be thrilled. Who? Who would want a, to write a book that isn't thrilling or right. 
<laughs> or want to read a book that wasn't thrilling, you know? I, I don't get that. And the smoke in and, our eyes was a characterization of that. Yeah, and I want to say for the folks who pick it up or go to Amazon and do a little sneak peek, don't let the first couple of chapters fool you because this is the point we're trying to make here. It doesn't start out of the gate like your traditional classic thriller. And, and uh, correct me if you think I'm wrong, but it doesn't start that way. But if you'll give it a little time, someone is reaching over there on the back burner and turning it up and you'll, you'll, you'll get more than a simmer and heat in just a couple of minutes, folks. <laughs> yeah. And, and it's, in a way, I kind of wanted to slide back a little bit into the atmospheric writers of guys like Raymond Chandler. And, right. you, you know, there were, there were several others in that era. Uh, and to do that, when you do that, you give the readers a way, especially in this world where they're, they're trapped in their screens, to get out of that. And then experience oh my god the first sentence actually said everything you know it's like it's it's i uh, i love being able to write a book like the smoke in our eyes and put it in the shelf next to six days of the condor you know they just to me they're kin and you know? I, I do think, you know, as I as I made that comment about not feeling traditionally thriller-esque out of the gate, I will say it is reminiscent of Six Days of the Condor, the way you started that book. But let me do this <clears throat> as we talk about the smoke in our eyes. I'm going to set it up, and then I'm going to have you add to it, much like an elevator pitch. And you kind of toyed with it for a second there, but I'm going to follow along. You're going to get it. Set in 1959. The Year the Music Died, The Smoke in Our Eyes is a cinematic clock-ticking saga set in a small Montana town. Now, you add to that to pull me in a step further. This is also the saga of the great dilemma we face between justice and law, all of which gets triggered by a tragic, fatal car wreck on a dark, lonely noir thriller night highway in montana out of that comes unbelievable vengeance out of that comes law breaking out of it comes the, the 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 choices the characters have to make and and there are little moments of terror like suddenly you're faced with a rattlesnake the size of a human adult male suddenly you realize you're being surveilled suddenly you realize that your friend is getting beaten simply because he's uh he's a grove uh, a a native american and there's nothing you can do to stop it those moments um the, mom the moments when essentially madness is triggered and destroys a house you're trapped in, that, that, those are all thriller elements that you don't see coming. And suddenly there you are, you know, race, racing down the streets that you've done with Lee Child and yep. with our, uh, some of our other great, uh, you know, Jeff Deaver, others. Uh, Steve Hunter. I mean, I, I, I start going down the list. I'm going to forget. <laughs> and then they're going to be on. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I'll be careful there. Now, uh, without going into where do you get your ideas without doing that, I would love to know, was there an inciting incident, something that happened to or around you or to someone, you know, that was that little seed that dropped in the fertile ground of your imagination and started to sprout the smoke in our eyes. I've never told this to anyone, so I'm going to tell it to you. I'm, I'm, I'm back in my hometown of Shelby, Montana. Uh, I want to say it was the mid-1980s, no, 1990s. And I'm just, you know, it's a small town. 
You drive yeah. around you're looking where, oh, I had a crush on the girl who lived there. Oh, there was where my buddy lived. And I turn a corner and there on a ramshackle house in pretty giant red letters were the words, there is no justice in Shelby. I'm glad I had my foot near the brake, but I stopped and I looked at this house and I realized that this had been painted on there by someone who was in real pain and anger and frustration. And I had to know what that story was. And that story triggered the smoke in our eyes. And it just, it, it just, it, it's one of those moments that uh, you, I couldn't have, I couldn't have made that kind of moment up. And it no. just, it, it still shakes me that, that, that envision, I can, I can even see looking at that. I, that I saw it out the right side of my windshield and turned the car so I could be sure to see it. It was, it was something. And that, that moment, that thriller moment, triggered everything else in the novel, The Smoke in Our Eyes. I just... Hmm. You know, uh, you made me think of something right now. And this is why I never leave the house without a notebook. And I got, I got way too many notebooks, uh, more moleskins than I care to count. Oh, <clears throat> but boy, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. If I, I will, if, if, if it's not visceral or, you know, a visual auditory, uh, but it's just a random thought, I got to scratch it down. I always scratch it down in one line and I put a date beside it because uh, I'll want to remember where I was when I had that moment. Now, oftentimes, if I've got the time at that moment, I'll sit down and go kind of a what if, and then I'll write a little paragraph. And then I'll, I might even, if I'm really on a tangent, and I don't mean to take away from you, but I think we share this thing perhaps in common. I, I might even come up with an idea. Oh, there's a guy named Jim Grady. Yeah, Jim. Jim's going to be the guy. And I'll just write a name and I'll write one little sentence of what I think and then I'll save it. And invariably, I don't know what it is because I can't tell you what I had for lunch yesterday or maybe even dinner last night, but I can have an idea 15, 20 years ago. I can tell you where it was when I had it. I wrote it down and I can sit there and turn it into a story. Do you have a similar thing that happens? Yes. And I think that all of our readers who want to be writers like you and me, they, they should accept those moments. I mean, I, 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 there's no other verb. I mean, and you can't manufacture the moments, but you can, you can definitely handle them in a way that lets you keep them and maybe someday use them. And like you say, I've had, I've had, I've had ideas and moments that I didn't use for 15 years. When yeah. I was, when I was an investigative reporter, I came across the the rumors of the CIA secret insane asylum and I spent years looking for it and eventually I realized wait a minute I'm a novelist I can make this up and out of it came one of my better novels called Mad Dogs um that's still working its way through Hollywood you know but uh yeah. it just it, it, you, you those moments are precious and rare, and I'm sure your wife is the same. She'll see you have a moment like that and go, should I stop the car, honey? You know, it just. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you peeking in my window? All right, let's do this. Let's leapfrog in, in a similar uh, direction and talk screenwriting because you're one of the few guys that appeared on the show who have dabbled more than a couple of minutes in screenwriting. And first of all, I want to say this because I have such huge respect for the late Stephen uh, J. Cannell, and I wanted to make sure I got his name right. Uh, legend in Hollywood, um, oh. a feat into itself that you got to work with him. So I want to know, what was that experience like, especially given that guy's prolific output in Hollywood over decades? It was it was an astonishing and wonderful chance I got. I I moved from Washington and left my new son and and wife and daughter here 
just because I got a chance to work under him. And what you learn about screenwriting coming from from writing prose is it's a whole different art form. And you have to, to learn and adapt that. And I, I remember the first time I went into Steve with, you know, my my finished draft of my script for one of the shows of his I worked on, he took it apart in a way that I have never been taken apart. And he did it with like uh, a kind dagger is the only way I can describe it. And at the end, he just kind of looked at me and said, go back and do it now. And it was it was like I learned so much in that incredibly painful half hour <laughs> yeah that i i it was it was like going to to college all over again and he was doing it most of it off the top of his head this guy sure. this guy could knock out a script in the, about you know 10% of the time it took anybody else to do it, and it would be a good script yeah it was he just he had a knack and an understanding the, about the difference differences of film of movies and of prose it was it was a, one of the most wonderful learning experiences i ever had sometimes it takes that velvet hammer to knock some sense into you and to get you to see things <laughs> a slightly different way <laughs> oh yeah oh yeah. yeah man and i know i know that you must have at that moment you had to have had that wherewithal that mental acuity to go I'm in one of the most well-regarded places I may ever be in my life. I, I have a, I'm at, I'm at the foot of a master. This is a master class in screenwriting. I mean, you are among a very few that got that chance. So kudos to you. Oh, wow. Wow. oh no. I mean, I, I can't tell you, David, how I, I, I felt both humbled, shaken, and so I almost swore lucky to have been able to have, have uh, you know walk out of there alive and with an education it was it was and i went back and this will not shock you oh my god the script that i rewrote was really a whole lot better it really? was just oh yeah you know it just oh yeah <laughs> imagine it, that yeah you know, and this was after I had been a successful writer for, you know, 15 some years. Uh, and, but and you, you know, but he, but you had been writing books. So books the trend, and yeah. The, and short yeah. stories. And I thought, well, you know, how, how bad could, could this script be? I right. couldn't tell you how bad it was, you know, it just, uh, and it was, it, it, and, and, as a boss, he made sure I got other uh, learning, you know, in instances. David Levinson, who was my immediate boss, took me on sets and, you, you know, gave me actors to work with so you could learn what goes on with them. Um, you know, listening to a, co a costume designer say, this would be a really great idea to dress this person this way, except these clothes are not going to stand up under the heat of the cameras. Wow. You know, it just, yeah, it, it was great. Man, what a tutelage. Yeah, that is so amazing. Now, for my audience who really loves the world of shiny trophies and you're wondering yet again, uh, who is this James Grady? Let me, let me mention just a couple. You received Italy's Raymond Chandler medal. Uh, Francis, let me see if I can say this Grand Prix du Roman Noir. Yep. Uh, again. Uh, <laughs> try being more here. Japan's Bakamisu literature award. And has been a mystery writer's, of America, Edgar Finless. I mean, James, you don't you don't get that kind of accolades and that kind of notoriety without really knowing what the hell you're doing. I learn, and the thing is, I keep learning. Every book 
becomes an educational experience. And I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'm going to pick up a, a Steve Hunter novella later this, this afternoon. And I, you know, he's got a Pulitzer prize and I'm going to, and, and I'm going to see what he did with one paragraph and go, I wish I'd known that 20 years ago. And, and he, he, would move me forward and the same I'll, I'll, I'll be reading a um, Megan Abbott or or any of, of of the other great screenwriters and excuse me novelists and short story writers of our time who write the kind of fiction you and I and our, our viewers love yeah and out of it comes oh I get the trick I mean, yeah. if, if you have time, I want to, can I tell you? Yeah, please do. So I, I'm in college and I'm, I know that I'm, I'm trying really hard to be a writer. And there's an, there's an author that I hope some of, some of uh, our, our, our pub, listening and viewing public go back and look, a guy named Alistair McLean. And Alistair McLean wrote The Guns of Navarone and a bunch of others. Oh. He, he, he had, I think, five or six movies. I would read his books and they were, they were good, but I didn't know how he kept me turning pages. You know, right. I mean, how, why can't I put this down and go see if Linda Levitt will go out with me tonight? You know, it's, <laughs> it's, and, and what I decided to do was I picked up one of his novels that was the most, w wouldn't let me go. And I read it something like 17 times in a row, I would finish it. I would go back to page one. I would go boom, 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 boom over the course of the summer. And, you know, third time through, you hate it. Fourth time through, you go, I'm bored. I know. Da, da, da. And then about reading 12, you learn his technique. And I learned from him that technique can be something you can develop and learn and use and make your own. You got to you got to make your own techniques, sure. and learning his, which I don't really use, um, was like a great educational experience. So I, I I don't like a I don't I don't think I could pick up another Alistair Klein novel novel. Now, if he, if he were still alive he and he gave me a novel, I'd be able to tell you what's going to happen on page roughly 20. Not maybe completely, but I know that that's when his technique kicks in with a, this kind of view. It was, All right. it was great education. Well, now you're killing me, James. I can you describe to me what that technique is? There's got to be something, some way that you can explain that we that uh, I and my listeners can grasp. He, in a way, borrowed from Dashiell Hammett, who you know essentially started noir literature. I'm that's you know he he did, and Hammett said, when you're going through your story. And, there, and the moment needs to accelerate the story, have a girl walk in with a gun in her hand. And immediately, the reader and, and your story get galvanized in a way that, that, you know, is completely unexpected. And that's what, what McLean did. He would, he would always, you know, move the action because of a character entering all right mm -hmm. and, and you know we all have the as steve cannell said you know while we have a three-act structure sometimes like william shakespeare it becomes a five-act structure which i never completely understood from him but you know everything has a beginning middle and end and what a good writer does the beginning middle and end doesn't just mean the plot it means the characters. It means the scenes. It means it means the setup when they have to drive to the grocery store so the car bomb can go off next to them. You know, it <laughs> it, it it it's 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 something that a technique like that is something that once you learn it, it makes the telling of your story 
a lot better for the readers. All right. I got a question for you that just popped up in my mind while you were talking about this. And it's this. Tell me a television show or a movie or streaming. It's all kind of related that you watch and you, James Grady, six days of the condor. How you doing? Says, Oh, wow. Nice technique. Ooh, note to self. Remember part of that trick, or it could be as simple as, Oh, wow. Didn't see that coming. Give me something that you see today in today's mass produced content machine that, that impresses you. It can be a show, can be a technique, can be an actor, whatever. I, uh, I, 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 and I, of course, just blanked on her name. There was, um, there's a, there's a woman writer who had a series, Phoebe Walker Bridges, who was in several uh, other shows. She is a great writer, director, producer. I follow her. Um, if I want to go back, one of the show, one of the things that really triggers me every time I see it, every time I see it, is the Magnificent Seven, the original one with Hugh Brenner yeah. and Steve McQueen. When you when you see um, a show like we're right now in the, my wife and I are, I think we're in season six or seven of Suits. And I can say there's a lot of things about the show I don't like and that don't work. And I'm going to watch it tonight. But it's just those kinds of things where suddenly you realize there's a story going on beyond that which you can predict. Um, I I really... I, I'm such a fan of that kind of, of writing. And, you know, it's, it's uh, in a way, and like, like you, you mentioned before, one of the problems we're having now is I've got, what, 50 some channels yeah. to pick from. And I've got, you know, after I finish reading the book I'm reading, I've got maybe three hours just finding them, just working yeah. the two remotes can you can can eat up like forty minutes, you know. So it's 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 great. I, that's one reason I, I still like to read reviews. Is yeah, they here's me. Go ahead. Here's I'm, one. Th here's one thing that Tammy, my wife, and I have done. We <laughs> we have you know by the time you do Apple TV and Paramount oh. and Showtime and uh, Max, and then you've got Apple and B and Amazon Prime, and then you've got cable, and then you go invariably, invariably with all that plethora of potential collateral to enjoy, nine times out of 10, we'll go, oh, let's just rent a movie, right? Or yeah. let's go back to, let's go back to something we really love, like, you know, all the president's men or three days of the condor. My point is, I guess this is a good problem to have um, because we have plenty of content out there. But I like you. I, I am always pulled to story first. I'm probably organically drawn to an uh, an actor first. So I'll, like, for instance, we're watching True Detective with Jodie Foster. Well, Jodie oh is God. a legend, has been around forever. So I will watch anything she does. She and doesn't do a bad frame. I know. It's crazy. So... Anyway, the point being, there's plenty of content, and we like to enjoy it. As we start to wrap, there's one of my one of my favorite things said about you, and frankly, it's the the line that got my attention a while back. It came from London's Daily Telegraph. You're probably tired of hearing this, but boy, folks, when you hear this, they named you as one of the 50 crime writers to read before you die. Now, let's just sit there and bask that a moment. Whether you like the Daily Tra Telegraph or not, doesn't matter. But that kind of accolade does not come out of nowhere. And I mean, at, fo at what, you're 42 years old now. I mean, to be able to have crafted this kind of career at such a... Oh, uh, yeah. 42. I'm, I, I, I actually, you know... <laughs> yeah. Point being, dude, what is... When you get that kind of uh, an accolade, you, you got to hang that on a banner. And, and it, when your wife comes in, oh, so, oh, yeah, Mr. 50 books before you... Yeah, yeah dinner's ready. I mean... That's... And that, you, you know, I, 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 I always 
just kind of fall into this space where I can't believe I'm so lucky that this happened. And then I get, I, I actually get nervous about calling the kids and telling them, you know, it's like, um, I don't want to brag here, but your dad just got called, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, oh, wait, I got compared to Bob Dylan and George Orwell. Oh, well, you know. Yeah. Um, how, what's going on with you? You know, yeah. how's, Brooklyn? you know, how's, <laughs> it's just, you know, you, you can't, and the, some of my heroes, um, uh, including Robert Redford said, you can't let that go on that go to your head. You, you, what you have to do is you just keep going on with what you're doing and yeah. who you are right. and being, and be so thankful. And that's, that's the best advice I got. You know, I try to start every single day with gratitude. If you got an attitude of gratitude, you're, you're halfway there. All right. Two more questions before we go. Number one, and I know this, I'm going to put you right dead on the spot. <clears throat> of all the books, all the short stories, all the screenplays that you've written, all the accolades, what do you, can you think of the one thing that you're most proud of having accomplished in this world of literary magnificence? I, it's funny. Well, the smoke in, in our eyes is my greatest novel and what I'm very proud of. I was able to be part of a, a, two groups of authors who created anthologies that were benefits for groups. We did one for a group called Share Our Strength that I was the editor of. The fighting homelessness. The real editor got hit with an amazing emotional trauma, so I had to take over and and that was to help landmine victims. And that I could that I could give back, not make a dime and not push anything about me out into the world by using the talent that that came to me out of nowhere. That's just that's that's to me is something I'm incredibly proud of. To be able to that's, help other people. That's when you know your heart's in the right place. All right. And here's the thing we close with. I ask every single solitary guest on my show, what's your best writing advice for aspiring writers? Work every day. I don't care if you only have, you know, 40 seconds between when you got out of the shower and when you got to put on your clothes to go to your 11 hour a day job. Take that mo that that forty seconds, turn that into a feeling. What you're writing, maybe write down, you know, three words that Bobby is going to say to to the guy she knows doesn't love her. Um, it just you you've got to work every day. This is not this is not a career for a slacker. You know, this is the, you got, you got to be true to your craft and that means working it. Superb. And I'd love to add a PS, not that you asked me and it isn't my, it is my show, but it's not my uh, platform right now. You are, but boy, uh, I hear so many people talking about, and I've heard this in conferences and so forth, James, about, oh, make sure you've got a good, strong platform and make sure your website is this and you're on social media. And while I think those are good things, I think some authors tend to spend a wee bit too much time there for reasons generally, possibly, potentially involving, oh, but I don't want to do the work right now. But if I do this, I'll be doing homework. And I think it's a little bit of a distraction that needs to be booted. What do you think? I completely agree. I, I had to give up my website because I was de de devoting too much time to it. I realized my job is to bring stories and characters and entertainment to readers' eyes, not tell them about me, not tell them about how things are going in the world. I want to. I want to serve my readers, and that means. I got to put my fingers on the keyboard and write about 
the story that I'm working on, not about James Grady. Well, that is a perfect tee up for usually where I go. Folks, if you'd like to learn mo more, go to jamesgrady.com, but we don't have a jamesgrady.com. So if people want to learn more about you or follow you, um, what is your best piece of advice to tell them uh, how to find you and so forth? Uh, you know, the only, the only social media I'm on is Facebook. I'm a bit of a recluse. I, I think the best thing to do is to just hit Wikipedia and it'll tell you what, <laughs> you know, where I've been and where I'm going. Tell me the link that we can find you on Facebook, because at least there I can I can direct my traffic to you. So oh, it's Facebook.com. It's just J James Grady. I'm me. And that's yeah. and you do it so well, James. <laughs> Man, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for the gift of your time. And thank you and thank everybody who watches or listens to this. And remember, keep reading and, and keep expanding your worlds. Thanks again, James. What an honor. Now, folks, I hope you're going to join me next Monday as the TZ welcomes Greg Hurwitz, author of the Orphan X series. We're going to discuss his latest thriller, Lone Wolf. That is Monday the 19th. Until then, I hope you're going to subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on both X and Instagram at The Thriller Zone, and sign up to be a part of our TZ family at thethrillerzone.com. Until then, I'm Dave Temple, your host. I'll see you next time for another edition of The Thriller Zone.